Fora TV. The world is thinking. Welcome to uh, the lunchtime debate, the credit crunch demystified. Um, this is this will be an in conversation, so there will be no formal introductions. The way it will work is um, I'll have a few questions for both of the speakers, whom I'll introduce in a moment. Uh, the conversation will last for around 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll open out to questions and points to be raised from the floor. So before I introduce the session itself, I'd like to introduce my two speakers. On my right, we have Phil Mullen, who's a Director of Business Transformation at EasyNet. Uh, today he's speaking in a personal capacity. Uh, he's also a specialist on international economic, demographic, and business issues. On my left, we have Michael Savage, who's uh, an investment banker uh, with an interest in financial economics and development. So to briefly outline the session that we're discussing, and we're, we're all aware of what's happened over the past year, and specifically the immediate direct causes for the credit crunch being the collapse of subprime lending uh, in America. And there's been much allocation of blame over the past year. Um, people have been looking at Alan Greenspan, who kept uh, the former uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve, who kept interest rates low for a very long time in the United States, holding down their cost of credit. Uh, people have looked for bankers who have recklessly expanded uh, the supply of cre cheap credit in America and the rest of the developed world um, through financial innovations such as mortgage-backed securities. Um, regulators have been blamed for not taking control of the situation and letting the free market uh, run wild almost. And also consumers, homeowners in particular, have been blamed for um, recklessly borrowing more than they could afford to repay um, on the basis of an assumption that house prices would continue to rise. And all this has now come unstuck, and it's come unstuck very dramatically. And things over the developments over the recent weeks and months have seen things go from bad to worse. So stock market values around the world have collapsed. Commodity prices around the world are falling. The money markets have frozen up, not just lending between banks, but also uh, commercial lending. The issue of bonds by companies has become more and more problematic. And central banks for the past year have acted as lender of last resort to um, the financial services sector. And now uh, treasurers are acting as buyer of last resort for uh, equity and, uh, to support and recapitalize uh, the banking sector. And over recent uh, weeks, we've seen the effects of the credit crunch go global, affecting um, the emerging economies from uh, Eastern Europe uh, to Asia to South America. And in the face of this, the IMF uh, looks increasingly impotent, although there's been uh, recent developments over the past week or so, which we might want to talk about in the discussion. Um, so... That's just to briefly outline where we are, and I think what we want to do in this session is to try and shed some light over what appears to be a financial crisis gone wrong um, by looking at developments in uh, the, the productive economy and seeing how we can relate the two uh, aspects of uh, the economy in the, to attempt to get a deeper understanding of what's taken place. So first of all, I'd like to... Um, Turn to both my panelists. I'll start with Michael first, just to see if we can work out on um, <clears throat> to, w to what extent uh, the current, what is the severity of the current crisis? How can we compare it to previous crises? So, Michael, if you can start. Well, it's, it's very severe, and it got very, very dramatically more severe in the last couple of months to an extent that, for most of us, was simply unimaginable. Um, it, was, it was really at the wildest fringes um, of, of the commentators that were predicting this, and it's, it's really taken most people by surprise. Um, in September, we saw 20 years' worth of consolidation within the financial services sector take place in a couple of weeks when you have you know, the largest insurance firm, AIG, being taken to uh, effectively state ownership, um, the collapse of Lehman Brothers. You know, one step after another uh, gets kind of worse and worse. Uh, 
Um, it's been described as the worst financial crisis in human history. But what's interesting is that the human cost of it is, relatively speaking, much more muted than anything that's happened, anything comparable to this in the past. In the financial sphere, it's, it's, it's categorized absolutely catastrophic, massive crisis, massive dislocation. Um, it is feeding through into the real economy. It will continue to do so, and things will get very bad. But what you're not getting is the immediate massive jumps in unemployment that you saw in, say, the early 80s or the 70s, um, the cal collapse of industrial activity, you know, the halving of industrial activity that you saw after the Wall Street crash in the U.S., and I think, in large part, that's been down to the um, action that's been, uh, that's been taken to avert it. So I think we shouldn't underestimate the severity and the impact that it's having. But you know, we should also um, recognize the, um, uh, the ways that it so far has been contained. OK, Bill, if we can move on to you. Yeah, bef uh, how severe is it? But before I comment on that, I think people just uh, like to just do one thing. Can you look around you? This is quite a big turnout for a discussion on the economy. <laughs> uh, I'm serious. Some of you were probably here last year like I was. If we'd had a session on the credit crunch last year, which I don't think was even on the agenda, but I'm stand to be corrected, we could have had it in one of the broom cupboards over there. <laughs> and there'd have been plenty of room for me and Michael to <laughs> chat. Um, and that, that's, while there's going to be, as Michael has said, a very severe downturn, which is going to continue. There's going to be a lot of misery, a lot of hardship for people. Um, one should see that there is an opportunity for people who are sympathetic with ideas, because we have had a quarter century of the depoliticization of the economy. The economy has been turned into a technical micromanagement issue, and that's one of the problems which we perhaps get onto in terms of how they've not been able to cope with what's been going on. This gives the potential a very severe recession, as I say, we doesn't want to gloat over people's misery, but it does give us the opportunity to repoliticize and to raise some very uh, profound questions about the nature of capitalism. There's a session later on about what's capitalism good for, which is, uh, I think we'll pursue that, obviously, with gusto. How severe is it? I I'd answer that in two ways. I'd, I'd endorse what, uh, what Michael said, in that on a sort of sequential sense, it's got worse and worse, and, you know, I'll admit, m worse than I thought it was going to be a year ago. We have had a mushrooming or a morphing of a subprime debt crisis in America, you know, these things happen, into an all-embracing financial crisis, into a banking crisis which affected the whole of the Western banking system, into a banking crisis which is now spreading elsewhere, and into a generalized economic recession. Now, I don't know if all those steps are absolutely necessary, but that is where it's going, and it's going to get a lot worse in that respect. The second way I'd answer the question, though, is to say that, uh, that uh, what is important, and one thing to take away from this discussion, is that we're not just discussing a financial crisis or even an economic recession. Um, it's what lies beneath that. Why have these things happened? And what it reflects, I think, is a fundamental um, atrophy of economic activity in the West. And that is a very serious problem. And what we've seen over the last year and a half, Michael, yeah, is the inability of Western leadership to cope with that economic atrophy. They've not been able to withstand the consequences of it. And it, all I, I don't like making predictions. You know, I go with Mark Twain, don't predict especially about the future. But my semi-prediction would be to say that I think they're going to find it much more difficult to contain the problems of economic atrophy. And that's, I think, the really serious thing when we talk about how severe it's going to be. OK, there's two points on that that I'd like to address in turn. Um, the last one, obviously, being the point about economic atrophy, but the first one being about uh, the depoliticization of economic management. Um, I'd just like to ask you, Michael, on the common, uh, one of the common comments that people make about the uh, actions made by central bankers and treasuries over the past year is that their management of the situation has actually been very good and much better than in previous crises. How, how does that relate to what Phil's just said about the depoliticization of uh, economic issues? Um, well, let me try and just split out two things here. I think, first of all, Phil's absolutely right about the depoliticization of the economy. And I think, um, you know, we both have a kind of mea culpa here. Um, you know, as critics, I think um, we all failed to see this coming. Uh, we failed to engage sufficiently with the economy. I think that's true absolutely across the board, from the, the you know, parliamentary opposition of the UK Conservative Party and the Republicans 
you know, right through um, all shades of the political spectrum. I think we all got kind of caught out a bit by this, and we're kind of um, uh, making up for lost ground. And I think you know, we have to acknowledge that and, and try and uh, you know, catch up and go forward. I think whilst absolutely endorsing the points about needing to politicize the economy and thinking about how we do that, there's an immediate challenge as well. And the immediate challenge is what do you do in this kind of immense um, crisis? And the cost of getting it wrong could have been catastrophic for everyone. So the immediate response was managerial. It was what do we do right now, you know, today, this hour? What do we do now um, to stop the complete meltdown of the financial system? Um, which would have been terrible. And I think in that respect, the steps that were taken were um, <coughs> decisive and effective. Um, mistakes were made. Um, allowing Lehman Brothers to um, fail was, in retrospect, a terrible decision. Um, I don't think they could have known that at the time, but it was the wrong decision to make. But by and large, on balance, within, within the context, they've done very, very well. And working inside the city and seeing some of these unfold on an almost hourly basis sometimes, uh, there really was a time at one week when the British banking system was within hours of failure. It, it was that bad. I mean, it was literally frantic phone, phone calls to the Bank of England because the banks were simply running out of money. And within that context, I think um, the actions taken have been very, very effective. Go, Phil. I must go and look at my dictionary for the word for um, effective and decisive. Uh, I don't recognize that description of what's happened over the last 14 months. Um, I think uh, as an expression of a, an out-of-touch uh, leadership or elite, I think this is a, you know, a, a, a very few examples can match this, I think. Um, if you look at the unfolding out of over 14 months, I think you can look at the, the, the sort of oscillation which there's been from the authorities between, on the one hand, putting their heads in the sand and just hoping it will go away, and telling us the fundamentals are sound, really, um, a, a sort of a panicky paralysis, because at the same time they were really, really worried underneath, but they just hoped it would, it would go away. And on the other hand, this sort of fitful firefighting. I mean, the 700 billion bailout in the, in the US, I mean, look at that as a instance of decisive uh, leadership. I mean, to me, decisive does mean you have to be resolute and a bit persistent and a bit consistent in it. And when you oscillate and vacillate backwards and forward, is there a problem, isn't there a problem, should we put in money, shouldn't we? I mean, it was not surprising, it was in the script really, that the bailout in the US would be rejected by Congress. Because when you look at it in a very technical way, with the supposed leaders of American society making this bold, resolute move to pour 700 billion, not a small amount, into the economy, they did not do it with any sense of political leadership, of actually establishing that this is something there was some urgency about. And so people could pursue their own different agendas and this and that, well, I don't want to be associated with this, do I? Is this going backwards on the free market and so on? And so it got rejected by Congress, right? That is not a definition of resolute activity. And even then, as the thing unfolded, then it, they swapped as well everyone else, I'm sure Michael was among them, uh, 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 was saying, don't waste your money buying IOUs, worthless bits of paper, America. Put some money into the banks, but they recapitalize them. That's the lesson from Japan. They denied. They said, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. And then a few days later, they swip over again, and then they, 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 uh, they start to put the money into buying up shares in the banks. I mean, this uh, catalog of indecisiveness is a symptom of the uh, state of, uh, of, of political leadership. And, you know, I think a lot of people uh, share that sentiment. I read George Soros, who I don't agree a lot with, but in an interview he did this week, he made the point that consistently from day one, the authorities have been behind the curve on this. They've been reacting occasionally uh, in, a, 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 in what appears to be a, 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 an incisive way, but really, when you look at it, underneath that, it's been going backwards and forwards, vacillation, lack of imagination. Well, can I, I think, George, George, can, like, can I just... Uh, um, one thing I wanted to highlight from that was the authorities being behind the curve. Uh, one of the things that you and Mike have both described very well is the fact that um, economic matters have been a matter of managerial discussions mm. rather than political debate um, in recent times. And Mike, I thought, put it very well describing that behind the curve uh, situation. Everyone's been behind the curve. No one saw this coming and no one really understood how serious it was going to get. Um, is it fair to pick out one uh, aspect and say that um, American politicians were behind the curve when everyone else was as well. Well, they're the people who are supposed to be leading society. So, yeah, I think it is, I th I think it is fair. They're the people who are supposed to have most access to the information and so on. The point is that it's not, I'm not talking about some sort of intellectual uh, uh, failing on the part of 
uh, Hank Paulson or in the part of Bush or whatever. You know, in a sense, they are expressions of what is a, this depoliticized climate that everyone just hoped that economic matters are technical. Uh, you know, we've been brought up for the last quarter of a century to think there is no alternative to the market. Uh, there's no reason to question the market. That's what, you know, Tina, there is no alternative, which is what has been the intellectual um, uh, uh, atmosphere across Western society. And in that context, you're right, it's, it's an expression of that. But I think, you know, we have to pull people to account on that uh, in, in terms of uh, the people that are democratically elected to run society have failed to recognize what the issue is. Interesting interview this week in uh, the FT with um, uh, Ta Tana Tana Tanaka, I think his name is. Yeah, uh, Heizo Takanaka. He's the Japanese economy minister who um, uh, was seen as one of the people who broke the banking crisis in, in Japan. And he was asked by the FT, what more do you think could be done? And he said, diplomatically, he said, more intellectual effort. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I mean, he was addressing the issue of, you know, they don't seem to be very clued up as to finding out where the toxic assets are, he says. They could do a bit more thinking about it. But I think there's got a point there that, you know, a bit more intellectual effort, uh, you know, would have helped to actually see that there's something more substantial going on. And clearly it's a matter of, not, it's a matter of recognizing the reality is changing uh, and therefore one has to try and understand what's going on underneath. And I've seen no attempt so far uh, uh, within our political leaders to uh, actually grasp the, those more fundamental questions. Well, I think we do indeed need to understand what's going on beneath, and I think it's very easy in a system where there are checks and balances to um, you know, recognise that there's debate and disagreement and uncertainty and hold that up as dithering and indecisiveness. But we have to ask the question, indecisive relative to what? We can compare it to history and say, I think, that this has been the most decisive and effective response to a crisis on this scale that we've ever seen. It just They have not been able to deal with it this quickly in the past or this effectively in the past. The other way that we could look at it is say, well, indecisive relative to what other people were suggesting we should do. The only people who had anything sensible to say in retrospect were a few people on the outside, like Nouriel Roubini, who saw a lot of this coming, who people like me thought were frankly barking mad a year or so ago. They had the most extraordinary um, negative view of how everything would unfold and it would all be terrible. And I think it would have been... Um, very surprising in that situation for them to have been able to carry along political leaders to recognize what to do. I think the problems that Phil's describing are problems with very uncertain events, very confusing events, events that have caught us all out. And I must say, I'm inclined to turn fire more on the critics and say that the critics actually have not been up to the task of putting forward um, a convincing alternative, taking people with them and showing what decisive action could be taken. My inclination is to step back from the immediate problem and say, well, what next is actually the more interesting political um, question. You know, the battle of ideas shouldn't be fought in retrospect about um, what crisis measures need to be taken. It needs to be fought in a forward-looking way about what we do next. Okay, maybe we can return to that in the discussion later. Now I'd like to move on to the second point that was raised uh, at the very beginning, which is the idea of... Um, the financial crisis being a reflection in some way of the problems of uh, economic atrophy within uh, the developed world. And as you raise this issue, Phil, I'd like to turn to Michael and say, is this a description that you recognize of uh, the developed world? No, <laughs> is the short answer. Um, it's, it's very clear that some of the um, growth and dynamism that we thought we saw in the Western economies um, was false. It was based on um, a financial system that is now going to give back many of those um, supposed gains. That said, it has been a period of tremendous consistent growth, which we should not um, uh, kind of take for granted, um, of dynamism and innovation, of remarkably high levels of employment and uh, wealth generation. Um, there wasn't enough, there could have been more, it could have been more consistent. We should have um, picked up on the issues within the financial sector earlier, um, said more about it, done something about it sooner. But overall, I would suggest that the Western economies have been relatively dynamic. Um, and in fact, you know, most of the um, activity that's being taken place in the emerging economies has been you know, the lower margin, lower value added um, things. It's been um, 
earth-shattering in a good way. It's transformed those economies and societies. Uh, it's transformed the global economy and created the basis for um, sustained growth across the planet, you know, all of which are great things. But I think we shouldn't recognize the very sharp differentials in terms of the um, kinds of economic activities that are going on. And I think we shouldn't be too kind of uh, negative about what's been happening in the West. Okay, Phil. Again, a different world. Um, I think you're fe fetishizing numbers for a star. I mean, one can look at growth statistics, and we all do, and you know, growth has looked pretty good, you know, 3 4% growth. But one has to look at the quality of that growth, and your allusion to the, uh, uh, the, uh, the emerging economies, I think, important, hopefully something we can come back to. There has not been that much wealth creation going on in the West. What there has been is prosperity based on wealth creation going on somewhere else in the world. Um, that if you look at the real drivers of uh, growth of the GDP statistics in the UK and in uh, the US, they've been driven by a combination really of three factors. They've been driven by uh, wealth in property, which has fueled uh, um, uh, consumption. So it's a mix of the, the property and the retail sectors and the way they've interacted. Uh, secondly, they've been driven by the financial services sector, which has grown enormously, a phenomenon I and others call as financialization. The economy has grown in the West from being one primarily based on the production of wealth, the production of goods and services, into one which is increasingly uh, based upon financial activities. 30 years ago, financial and business services, both in Britain and in America, uh, represented about a seventh of the economy. It's about 15% of the economy. That has now grown to a third of the economy in both those areas, right? So the amount of activity which is based on shuffling money around and is based on providing the business services which go with that, legal, accounting, and so on, has become a significant part of the economy. In the meantime, the productive part of the economy, uh, the industrial part of the economy, has shrunk almost in, uh, in the reverse order. Um, we've got down to manufacturing sectors and to industrial sectors, which have grown, gone down from a third of the economy 30 years ago to becoming about 15%, 16% uh, of the economy. Manufacturing in America, you know, the tremendous growth that you're talking about, is 12% of the economy at the moment. If you look at profits made by American businesses, um, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, profits of American corporations, about one-fifth could be attributed to financial activity. Do you know what the percentage is today, at least before the uh, crisis in the last 12 months? 27%. More. It's in that range, but it's about 50%. If you add up the profits of American financial institutions and the financial activities of non-financial institutions like General Electric's bank and stuff, it amounts to 50% of the economy is based on financial activity. Compa contrast that to the East, well, I won't go into, but uh, you know, it's a quasi different situation. So you have to look at the quality of that growth. The third driver has been public spending. So you've had property and retail combined, the consumption side. You've had the financial sector, business services, which is effectively parasitic on wealth creation elsewhere in the world. And you've got the public sector. We've now removed two of those. Financial sector's imploded. Property and retail is fast on the, on the way to that. And so all that Western economies have got, this great, tremendous growth and wealth creation, is to rely on public spending. And what we're going to see, again, avoiding the predictions and the, the danger of predictions, but you could see the possibility of this banking financial crisis turning into a state deficit crisis as uh, all the economies uh, uh, pump prime their economies. There is very little substance in there. It's a hollowed out economy. The Lex column, just to finish, classic, beautiful line that the Lex column and the FT penned over the summer when they said, you know, when an economy doesn't make much anymore, watching its property, retail, and financial sectors implode leads to the question, what's left? You know, and I think that's a very good thing for us to think about. What is left in the West apart from being able to reap and benefit from value productions in Asia? Very little. Well, I mean, Phil accuses me of fetishizing numbers, but he is quite a lot of them in there. And I, I, you know, one of them just to pick up on is this idea that 50% of profits come from the financial sector. Or, you know, therefore, um, you know, the financial sector is that part of the economy. Um, you know, a lot of that is to do with um, you know, the accounting treatment of these things, the role of um, things like private equity companies, um, you know, the, the way that profits are accounted for rather than the activity that's actually going on within that economy. The more important number, I think, is that the U.S. is still a quarter of the global economy 
economy. Um, you know, the, the, the vast amount of, um, of stuff that goes on within the global economy is still in those, those major traditional economies like the US and, um, and Europe. And so I would expect it to remain for quite some time. And it's very interesting how despite the implosion of all of those sectors that Phil's described, what's happened? Well, we haven't seen um, you know, a rush to buy emerging market um, currencies. We haven't seen people um, you know, rushing out to expect their stock markets to boom. Quite the opposite, in fact. You know, people have turned back to America because it's the bedrock of the global economy still. Um, you know, where has China been in the resolution of the, um, the current financial crisis? It's all been led by America. You know, the, the country that Phil describes as um, you know, dithering and indecisive in its response has actually been the only country in the world with the, the financial breadth and depth to be able to, um, to, to deal with and manage this kind of, um, of crisis. I think there are a couple of underlying things that are worth um, picking up on. One of them is the um, international, well, the globalization of production, which means that you get this kind of um, disaggregation of different parts of the production process. The parts of the production process that um, you know, add most value to the end product are taking place in the US and in Europe. The parts that can be um, you know, moved around the world and that produce um, you know, relatively little added value are, um, are going on in the, um, in the emerging economies. Uh, which isn't to say that they're not going up the value curve, that they're, they're doing more and newer things and that that trend will continue. But I think it is important to recognize that we're not there yet. And I think that the other aspect to, to um, bear in mind is what we actually spend our money on. Because I think Phil is also fetishizing manufacturing. Um, and I think a lot of commentators do this. They look at where the stuff is made for being where the economic power is. But you know, the reality is that we spend an awful lot of our income on, um, on services. You know? So part of the manufacturing process involves contracting out business services which are paid for and you know, make a lot of money for the countries that provide them. And a large part of individual personal consumption is also based around services. So that in itself shouldn't be a bad thing for the global economy. You know, it was something that the, um, the recent Nobel Prize um, in economics winner, Paul Krugman, was talking about in the 1980s, was saying that you know, he would expect the financial sector in Britain to become very much larger, focused on London, simply as part of the integration of the European economy. More financial activity will take place in London and less elsewhere in Europe. So it came to pass. I don't see it as, as much of a problem as Phil does. Okay, I'd like to go out to the audience now um, for qu any questions that you want to raise to either of our speakers or comments. Um, we've had two very different takes and there's already lots of hands. So do we have roving mics? About uh, Yeah, so if you can just go to the guy um, in the middle there. Um, Thank you for that very interesting introduction. As we're talking about ideas, I'm just wondering where this ideology comes from, I think we know where it comes from, um, of the market always being right, everything being attributable to markets being um, the best of all possible worlds if they function correctly. And I would like to hear more discussion about the role of the economics uh, profession, particularly textbook economics, um, the, the mainstream economics has various ways of categorizing it, because I think that at, at the root is a failure of economics in the past however many years you want to say, decades anyway, many decades, actually to get a grip on what it is about capitalism that makes growth happen, because we know that it has this property, but textbook economics does not actually have a good explanation of this. It's not in the financial sector, it's something in the real economy. If we understood it better, we could actually influence more how growth happens, who it affects, you know, okay. poor versus and so okay. on. Okay. Great, thank you. Now, there's a few hands up around here, so I'll take a cluster from here. Um, if you, the guy just next to you, start off with. Uh, if people can uh, stand up as well, so we can all get a good look at you. Uh, Phil uh, criticised the um, politicians for not recognising the crisis and quoted John McCain saying the fundamentals of the economy are still strong. Um, but what this crisis has shown, maybe more than anything else, is the extent to which the markets are based on confidence. And if, um, when politicians do recognise the crisis, such as when Alistair Darling said the economy is at its worst point in 50 years and the pound slumped, everyone criticising him for, for, ruining, for ruining the confidence. And I, it seems to me that the politicians can't win, and I wondered what you would expect them to say publicly. Okay, if we just hand it round to the guy at the front there. 
You mentioned um, the three sources of, um, of, of growth, if you like, one of which was um, public, um, public spending. I'd like to know what the Speaker's views are on the deficit uh, financing, which to me seems to be the only way to go, but I know that one particular party isn't particularly keen on it. As, uh, and possibly coming to that, the, the, the um, linked with that, um, the government's buying an awful lot of shares. Do you see the government possibly making quite a big profit on selling banking shares? That may be being the answer to deficit financing, in that you don't actually need to run such a large deficit because you make a profit on, um, on the, the share sales. Okay, if we just one more here and then we'll go through a few in the middle and then come back uh, to the panel. M Michael, uh, it's extraordinary what you just said because the whole financial marketplace, in order to have made the, the margins that it's made, has, has created this crisis. So in order to make these profits, how, how are the banks going to make profits in the future? How is the financial sector going to make profits in the future? That's the question. They've, at the cost of what they've done, this is the crisis. So to talk about to fly the flag of, you know, how, you know, how, 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 you know, as a result, we have seen advances, of course, we've looked around, you see cranes, you see development, you see property uh, development, but what's the consequence now? That's mm -hmm. the question we should be asking in terms of, you know, the consequence now will be everybody's living standards are going to be pushed down, and what else is going to happen to us for the short-term advance for, for what you, you've really flown the flag on? Okay, the guy who's got the mic, and then we'll come back to the panel for a second. All right, uh, first of all, uh, I'm a German student, so I have to apologize for my English, but uh, anyways, I, I'll try to make my point. Um, because um, as I understand capitalism, capitalism is about free market, free choice, um, the prop, uh, private, pri private uh, ownership of, of property, and of the absence of, uh, of governmental interference. And so my point would be, uh, where is this financial crisis coming out of capitalism? Because the financial markets, the money markets, the money production, all of it is central planned by, we have a central pr a planning bureau, which is called the Federal Reserve, the uh, European Central Bank. They are um, like free, voluntarily, um, they're setting up or down interest rates. They're creating uh, money out of thin air actually. And uh, otherwise we have uh, also a fractional reserve banking system, which is allowing privileges to uh, bankers uh, which none of, uh, of our normal individuals have, which is um, lending uh, property, which isn't their own property. So why aren't, why aren't we talking about the, the real issues, which would be like uh, the abolishment of the central banks and the, the uh, re, um, requirement of a full uh, reserve banking system. And the banks, uh, please don't, don't answer with, the banks wouldn't do any profits with that because you know, as well as I do, that banks do profits with their uh, purpose uh, with their um, uh, financial intermediary, like they can they can borrow money which has actually be, been saved. But uh, what banks are doing more and more often is lending money which isn't saved at all, which is like created out of thin air. And okay. um, that would be my Thank point. You. Thank you very much. Okay, I want to turn to you first, Mike. Uh, there's lots of questions. Feel free to respond to any of them. But one of them, uh, one of the themes that's come up is the idea that this. Credit has come out of thin air, as the guy just said, and other people mm. pointed to. Where has all this credit come from? Is that is it just being invented by the bankers, and now it's come to an end? Um, there's something in that, but that, in a sense, is always the story of banking. That's just you know what banking does, and uh, you know that doesn't really explain the current crisis. I think you know to take a step back from that, what's what's driven the current crisis that's a bit different um, is, is the additional money that's been pumped into the system, not simply through bankers doing what banks do, which is you know lending out money that they, they don't have, borrowing it from the markets and lending it. Um, it's, it's to do with the additional money that's been coming from the Asian economies and from the oil exporting economies. And you've had an absolutely enormous level of global imbalances where countries like Britain, America, um, South Africa, Australia, Spain, certain other economies, but primarily the US, the UK, have been spending more money than they've made, quite simply. And other economies, like the oil producers, the commodity producers, China and East Asia, have been um, borrowing, uh, sorry, saving um, vast amounts of money. And the consequence of that is that they are putting, pumping all of that money into those economies, and that's the money that the banks have been um, you know, lending out at lower and lower rates. I think that's really the kind of crucial step to understanding the current crisis is the way that that's worked. So if you want to look for a scapegoat in the current crisis, I point the finger at the Chinese working classes. <laughs> Um, because the Chinese working classes just haven't been, uh, you know, for, for a number of different reasons, have not been um, consuming their fair share. <laughs> <laughs>
rather than uh, you know, rather than uh, you know, buying buying new SUVs and uh, you know all of the other nice things that we have in the West, um, they've been um, subsidising us, and the result of that is that um, you know the, through standard economic processes, that just means that interest rates become very, very low in, in the West, and, you know, the banks just sort of stand in the middle and force that money, um, you know, into, you know, wherever they can lend it, which has been, you know, essentially inflating housing markets in the West. Um, to undo that, you know, to have a, a more, more kind of you know, sensible, balanced financial system, um, well, the Chinese should consume more. That's, that's the way out of the crisis. I imagine you've got a very different take on the Asian subsidy of the West. Bill? Well, to, apart from the, uh, the uh, tongue-in-cheek way Michael presented that, at least he, he half answered his question as to, you know, what's China been doing all this? Why haven't they been helping? Well, the reality is that China has been keeping the West afloat. Uh, people talk about, uh, I was asked, the first question is, what do the economic textbooks say about this? Well, uh, the economic textbooks um, don't say that China is supposed to uh, send money to America. They say the opposite. They say the rich countries are supposed to send money to the poor countries. That's the way capital flows are going to go. So one of the byproducts of all this in 10 years' time is someone's going to have to rewrite some textbooks, but that's, you know, by and by. The reality is that the value production is going on in the West. Banks can make profits. Yeah, of course, HSBC makes a lot of profits. Barclays makes a lot of profits. That's not new value creation. It's their ability to cream off profit made elsewhere in the world. The financial stability report that came out this week from the Bank of England, which you may have read, what, Tuesday or Wednesday, made the point that the early, at the beginning of the 20th, the, at the beginning of this decade, broadly speaking, deposits and loans in the British banking system were equal. Now there's what they call a, 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 a customer deficit fund or whatever, customer funding gap, they call it, of 700 billion pounds. Where's that come from? It hasn't come from Michael's friends in the city busy making profits and creating a lot of values. It's come from capital flows from elsewhere in the world. And so that's what China's been doing. China's been doing fine, thank you, making a lot of profits. Uh, those of you that weren't in the session earlier on China, I think China's going to have a hard time in the next couple of years as a spillover of this. But the reality is China's been making the values, and it's been doing a lot, keeping the American economy afloat. America, this great pinnacle for you know, world leadership and stuff, America is the most indebted country in the world. Now, you and me, if we don't get any income and we have a credit card, we can live quite well and buy lots of things and be quite prosperous until uh, the credit card bill comes in and until the bailiffs come round. In reality, America's been living off credit from the rest of the world. It is the most indebted country in the world, and that's uh, an interesting thing. You have the, uh, a country that presumes to be the world's economic leader, which is in hoc to, uh, 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 to the rest of the world. And that means that underneath this, there is an economy that's based on fictitious capital values, you know, things which are uh, 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 turning money into money, in a sense, and based upon um, uh, 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 the hard effort of those Chinese workers elsewhere in the world. Don't blame them. Let's, and in terms of being asked, what should, the, what should the leadership do to here? It's to recognize the severity of the situation. We need to look at this crisis at two levels. I say, sure, we can have the discussion, which is the, 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 the topic, the credit crunch, but it's what's going on under, under, underneath. And my final point on that is that what has been going on underneath is not enough productive investment in the West. The question is raised, what's the reason or what's the driver for growth? Okay, people may have different views, but fundamentally it's about productive investment. There's been very little going on in the West, a lot going on in other parts of the world. That is a qualitatively different character of economic activity, and the politicians don't recognize how bad things are in the West. Okay, more questions. Right at the front, uh, the guy at the front here, and then there's a guy in a suit in the middle there. Oh, the back. More than one, I'm sure. <laughs> yes. uh, I'm wondering whether, uh, whether this crisis, uh, if it's just a question of technical management to get us out, or whether we need political leadership as well. Would, it, would a Churchill or a Roosevelt or somebody telling us we've done nothing to fear but fear itself, would that help us, or is that just a gloss on it and it's really up to the technocrats? Okay, and pass it. It's on. Question for Phil. Um, where do you think the opportunities for real value creation through productive investment are that aren't being taken in the Western economies? And would that not just exacerbate the underlying problem? Um, yeah, that's it. Okay, and the guy who's got the mic in the middle. Right. Uh, yeah, it, it seems to me that uh, they seem to be making this up along, as they go along, their response to the credit crisis, whether it's uh, 
uh, a good hand played or not. But uh, what, con what concerns me about it is uh, the UK government's bailed out the banks to 500 billion. That's, uh, I, I couldn't believe that figure at first. Uh, but what, what, does that, what does that mean? It, it seems to me that uh, they're going to go, they're going to carry, carry on with uh, uh, measures they've taken already, like, uh, like sustainable living. Are we likely to see an, uh, that concentrated? Are we likely to sort of like be squeezed even more along this path? Uh, which seems to me to be what lies, lies at, the, uh, at the basis of the credit crunch, uh, this lack of confidence. Okay, and then we've got two uh, at the back there. Um, I, I agree with some of what's been said, and I disagree with some of the way it's been presented. Um, with what Phil said, I think, I mean, you know, leaders being behind the curve, I mean, that's the definition of a crisis, otherwise it wouldn't be a crisis. And the, econo and the kind of dithering in uh, Congress... I mean, surely that's democracy. You know, that's representatives uh, voicing their problems, maybe opportunistically, maybe playing to the gallery, whatever it may be. But that is actually the process of democratic debate. And given all that, it was shoved through surprisingly quickly. We can make specific kind of criticisms of the Paulson plan, but I don't think like um, characterizing the process through what happened as being um, dither dressing up kind of the democratic process as dithering. I think, you know, suggests as if, like, we should be run by dictators kind of acting decisively and push, you know, pointing the finger and everything happens immediately. I think that would be a wrong impression to give. In, and in terms of what Michael has suggested, I think it's illegitimate to suggest we need to politicize the debate about the economy and then accept what was given to us in terms of the crisis, in terms of the bailout. So, you know, accept the kind of blackmail, okay, we can have the debate, but in the meantime, we're going to go through this technocratic process. We're going to splurge all this money on this particular sector. Let other sec, you know, I mean, nobody would give 700 billion to uh, the car workers in Detroit to hold up that sector of the economy. But it's seen as legitimate that we have to be blackmailed. The whole public has to be blackmailed into accepting that we need to put 700 billion into the financial system, which our own leaders and uh, economic and political have already screwed up. Okay, uh, if you just hand it to the guy behind you. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> one uh, quick comment. Um, one of the earlier questioners said, where is this belief that the markets are always right coming from? Um, to follow the market, we don't have to assume that they're always right. We just have to assume that they're right more often than politicians, which I, I think is a much easier um, hurdle. Um, the, the question to Michael is about regulation, something that people have uh, um, mentioned a lot. Um, two questions. First is, is have is what we've seen a failure of reg regulation in the sense that regulators weren't doing their jobs? Or is it just in hindsight that we see they've failed, but this was like a completely unexpected event? And the second question is, um, do we need um, different rules for regulating uh, the financial sector, or, is, um, the existing, or are the existing rules good enough and they just need to be utilized differently? Okay, we'll come back to the panel now and then go straight out for the last round of questions before we sum up. Um, Phil, anything you want to take from the questions raised there? Sure, yeah. In, in terms of uh, productive activity and in terms of what could be done, um, you've, you've had a situation, it's a, it's a, a period which I've described in, in what I've written on it as a, a period of sort of 15 years of a, what I call a sad economy, stable, anemic, uh, but durable. Other people called it the great moderation. That you had a situation where for a long time, basically from the end of the 80s through to two years ago, a year and a half ago, where the Western system has been able to cope with its difficulties. It's been able to cope with low productive investment. It's been able to cope with um, a, 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 a sort of a moribund uh, uh, productive sector, which um, it has never forcefully uh, restructured. It's been able to cope to keep ticking along in a sort of anemic way with the benefit of all that credit that's been created, with the benefit of the political stability, because they've faced no challenges either domestically or internationally. It's been like a, uh, you know, a, uh, uh, a sort of hiatus for them, or a, period, a, a breathing period where they've been able to, on a very reactive way, just cope, just muddle through being able to maintain a modicum of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, rising prosperity. They've now had the comeuppance that an economy which is based in that way, which has not 
uh, restructured itself in a productive way, which is the way the market system needs to uh, regenerate itself every so often, has come up against the buffers. Now, in terms of then being able, if you're looking at it from a what does capitalism need to get itself going again in the West, it does need a more profound period of restructuring, uh, not just sort of spending some money on it, but it actually has to regenerate itself, refresh itself. That's what it needs to do. Uh, and I'm emphasizing that, not saying I'm standing up here saying this is the leadership I would like to give to society, but I think we have to recognize that there is an absence of comprehension of what is going on in the various ways that people have been sticking plaster to different aspects of the financial system. Um, I will say that, you know, clearly for us here, um, the criticism should be, as Michael and I agree with him here, is on the critics of capitalism, right? That it's a tremendous opportunity now to actually make those criticisms of a market system which can only progress and move forward on the basis of perennial cycles of, uh, uh, perennial cycles of destruction. The moment, though, I would say the emphasis should be on um, recognizing the more sort of positive universalizing side of capitalism, which those critics which do exist today, the sort of the small-minded critics, are saying that capitalism has gone too fast, that it's been too excessive, that it has been too um, uh, ambitious in what it has done. So to the extent to which there are critics of capitalism, there are critics which um, can, uh, 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 are criticizing, in a sense, the most progressive aspects of capitalism, and I have no truck for those. You know, the, the height of anti-capitalist criticism at the moment is basically basically saying, Michael, you're a representative of the greedy bankers, you know, or, you know, you've got too much money or too much bonuses. I mean, that is just so glib and so unhelpful. And it's been highlighted this week, I think, when you can see from the beginning of the week to the end of the week, the focus has gone from one bunch of greedy people, you know, the bankers, to somebody else who's quite well off, namely Jonathan Ross. You know, the same sort of vehemence in terms of informs both, uh, uh, both outbursts, really. And it just shows how superficial is anti-capitalism today. So the real message lesson for us is that we've got to regenerate, repoliticize anti-capitalist thinking to see what is wrong with the, uh, uh, with the market system as a way of taking society forward. But in a very profound way, not criticizing the superficial excesses and wastage and, uh, 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 and uh, uh, inefficiencies of the system, which have always been there. Okay, Michael, can I just ask you, uh, <clears throat> Phil described there um, a situation of past 10, 15 years or longer where um, there's been quite moderate but consistent uh, growth within the developed economies. Um, but the fact there hasn't been any major restructuring or major dynamics within the developed world. And lots of people tr explain that in the terms of what we were discussing previously in the relationship of the more dynamic growth within uh, the emerging economies in the world. And is that a description you recognize, or do you think that actually America is dynamic? I mean, that doesn't really make... I mean, do you recognize that description to start off with? Um, not really, no. I'm, I'm surprised that Phil, Phil brought it up, actually, because I think, um, you know, s um, stable, anemic, and durable doesn't really describe the economy of that period. Clearly, it wasn't stable. Um, it's not proven to be durable. All of those instabilities were under the surface. I mean, lots of people did recognize it, not to the extent that actually transpired, but, you know, many of us recognized the, um, the risk from the bubbles and the, other, the imbalances, said that it wasn't... Um, um, stable. Um, was it anemic? Well, no, it wasn't anemic. It was, it was a great period of, of consistently strong growth, consistently high employment. And, you know, relative to other periods, it was, it was great. It was a really great time um, for the economy. And I think if you compare it with periods of great industrial expansion, I mean, a good example is, you know, between 1870 and 1913, you had the industrialization and uh, integration of the American economy. But over that period, it spent more than 45% of the time in recession. So there was a slight, uh, you know, slightly more period, of, a longer period of growth than recession overall. But it was bumping around all the time with massive, at a massive human cost in terms of dislocation, unemployment, um, you know, people thrown into poverty, unable to plan for the long term. Compare that to the kind of innovations we've had recently, and, well, I'd, I'd rather have, um, you know, the economy of that, that period. So I don't recognize um, any part of, of that. Sorry, Phil. Um, and I just want to make, if I may, one other point, which is, um, you know, a couple of people have asked around regulation and, you know, why this sector, why the bailout? Well, you know, it, it's not about favoring one sector over another. It's simply that the role banking plays in the economy means the choice was bailout or depression, and it, it was as blunt as that. You know, they had to do something like that to prevent, um, you know, much more serious consequences across the whole economy. 
That, though, raises another very important point, which is the one about regulation, because banks cannot exist without that state guarantee, and they don't pay anything for that state guarantee. And I think that people have been quite right to, to raise that kind of criticism of saying, well, you know, what the banks really are doing is um, you know, extracting um, profits from a government guarantee that they're not paying for. And I think that does raise some of the questions about regulation, which in the technical sense are very difficult, but in the political sense I think are really important because it does raise all the questions about planning, uh, which I think go much further than industrial reorganization. You know, this is what the, the kind of great student of, of depressions, Hyman Minsky, the, the economist who understood this we best, if I can just finish this one point, described as phony radicalism. You know, you just call for industrial policy, you say you need some restructuring, and you leave it at that. And, you know, I think we need so, um, something a bit more, um, a, a, you know, a fuller critique. Okay. The other point that Phil raised was about this being a real opportunity to provide a, a more pro-growth uh, criticism of the, um, the way the economy has been uh, running for the past 10 years, almost on autopilot by uh, managerialism. Um, your description of events so far does sound, in a lot of ways, very managerialistic. Uh, can you, how do you, um, do you agree that we need to provide a more radical critique of the economy? What, how does that fit with the, what your descriptions have been so far? Well, I completely agree. I, I think that my description is the managerial only in as much as I recognise the need for short-term crisis management, um, you know, which is managerial rather than political. And I think um, you know, there has been a remarkable consensus amongst um, uh, economists and politicians about what needs to be done in the short term. In the longer term, I, I think my critique is actually less managerial than, than Phil's because you know, Phil is talking about um, you know, a bit of industrial restructuring, a bit of planning. Um, I think we need to think uh, more fully about how we, um, how we plan an economy, how we um, think about managing the financial sector, recognizing that implicit government guarantee, uh, and, and restructuring society more fully rather than just focusing on um, you know, how production is organized. Okay, before uh, Phil gets a chance to respond to that, we'll come out for a last round of questions. So we've got a couple of people with mics already. Um, uh, in, the, um, in society in general at the moment, there's a, a very strange sen uh, feeling of denial uh, about the implications for the oncoming recession. And uh, listening to Michael, I must say, you know, you'd be, you'd be quite um, uh, happy to go along with that sort of thing because it feels as if you're saying there's going to be some minor corrections everything that is going to kind of go back, back to normal. And I, I'm quite astonished, actually, that that, that appears to be what you're, what you're saying, because it, tell you what Phil says, who, 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 whose views I broadly concur with. Um, the implications of what he's saying is that the, uh, the, both the proponents and the critics of capitalism are bankrupt in their ideas of how to get us out of this situation that we're in, that Western societies economies are so badly unstructured that they will take years and years and years to recover from a, an economic recession uh, and that uh, by implication the IMF is going to be called in more and more to weaker capitalist countries and I'm old enough to remember what that actually means uh, when the IMF goes to weaker capitalist countries. It means they go along and they say shut down your education system, shut down your hospitals, don't spend money on public spending, <coughs> pay us our money back. You know, we're talking about a fundamental break with the past here. And if we uh, allow ourselves to believe that we're going to go through a small period of pain and then more or less things are going to correct themselves, I'm really, really sorry. You know, all of us are going to be very badly hit, not just in this country, but across the world by what's coming down the line. And the urgency is for us, and it's absolutely urgent. In many ways, this is the most important debate that's going to take place this weekend. The urgency is for us to recognize that we have to play a role in coming up with an understanding, first of all, of what's really going on here, which has been why this debate's been very useful, as a precondition to coming up with some proper ideas of how to deal with it. Okay, thank you. And there's one over there. Hi. Is it working? Can you hear me? Um, I've got two comments, really. One's about the role that the media have to play in all of this and in creating a level of panic at certain points, and I'm thinking mainly about Northern Rock there. Um, and my other point, which I've now forgotten, was... Uh... Okay, thank you. There's a guy at the back and then a guy with a beard. Um, all right, um, my, my question is sort of... You, you spoke about the uh, inability... 
in Western economies to profitably invest capital. Um, is there possibly um, a similar problem in the East? Because all of this capital that's floating around these sovereign wealth funds is being invested in, like for instance in China, I've, I've heard there, um, a lot of their stuff is more or less job creation schemes rather than a productive capitalist economy. Do you think that they're facing a similar crisis of being una unable, maybe in a slightly less obvious way as us, um, being able to reinvest their capital to produce profit? Okay, next. Hi. Um, there is, um, we've had this period in which there has been no alternative, an ideological consistency. But there is a classical tradition of economic crisis theory, um, particularly to Phil, how, how much is that economic crisis theory vindicated by what we've seen over the recent months? And what are the areas where that theory needs to grapple with new realities to um, tackle this situation? So what is the theoretical task to um, pursue a, a more cogent critique of the current situation? Asset price booms and busts play an important role in most financial crises, and this current crisis is no exception. I was just wondering, you know, looking forward, what policy you should do about this. Specifically, should we try to stabilise asset prices, particularly property prices? I've got a number of suggestions as to how we might do this. We could use monetary policy more to stabilise property prices. There are various ways of using the tax system. And uh, one suggestion would be, uh, via regulation, have a maximum loan-to-value ratio on mortgages, which one could use to try to stabilise property prices. So um, would um, ideas on these lines be a good idea. Okay, I've only got time for one last quick point, which is the lady at front, just down. I just wanted to refer back to the comment about globalization um, and your, your reference to higher value added um, activities being in, in Europe and the United States. To what extent should we regard these as unfair trade practices and actually bring that into the debate? So sort it of ties up with the, the point earlier on about the IMF as well. Okay, thank you. If I return to the panel, there's one question I thought you might want to come back on, uh, Phil, as well as all the others, obviously, is the question about why, is, um, why isn't China investing this money in China? Why is it sending it to America? Is this the final comment? Um, yes, and actually we've got a final sum up now as well. Sorry. And my final comment. <clears throat> yes. Um, well, China's investing a hell of a lot at home as well. I mean, 40% of... Yeah. Uh, of uh, GDP there is uh, based on domestic investment uh, and a lot of that is from uh, retained profits from companies within China so you know they perhaps go up to 50% but you know they are creating an awful lot of values and more values than they can use at the moment and uh, uh, America's obviously been very grateful to be able to um, take advantage of those to live on the uh, to live on credit for a bit um, as is my final comment I, I would just reiterate my point that this is much more than an economic problem. Uh, it's much more than a financial problem. And so while I, you know, we can have a discussion about what sort of bits of sticking plaster and what uh, uh, you know, uh, firefighting should be done to get the financial system going again, and we can have a good discussion about that, one has to see that there is discussion that takes place at a different level as well, at an intellectual level, about the nature of uh, the market system, about the nature of capitalism. And the first point to grasp in that, which unfortunately uh, is not one that Michael shares, is that underlying we have a very hollow, uh, 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 econo a very hollowness to the character of economic life in Western societies. Um, uh, we also have, and in parallel to that, the other burning question of our age is going to be uh, the imbalances, not between savings and consumption, but the imbalances between economics and politics on a global scale because uh, those are very much out of sync. So you have two intellectual challenges, much more than economic challenges, to understand that atrophy within the Western uh, dynamic or the lack of the Western dynamic. How has that come about in terms of people asking about, you know, what are the theoretical questions? How is capitalism coping with that? How is it uh, attempting to overcome those barriers? Because I agree entirely with the point at the back, we're not going to revert to the way things were five years ago or three years ago. It's not going to be a temporary blip and somehow they go back because capitalism has come up against certain barriers which have expressed themselves in a financial crisis, in a banking crisis, which has then had those uh, real economic effects. But that's not the real problem. The real problem is why do we get to that situation? Why is the market um, uh, a system in the West 
Um, being able to survive for a period of time, for those 15 years I talked about, on the basis of doing very little except uh, uh, relying on fictitious capital and credit fuel consumption and uh, uh, financial activities and borrowing from abroad. But it's come up against that. How does, it, how does it grasp that? And that's the theoretical question on the domestic front. On the international front, the question is how do you reconcile uh, a, a situation where the world is upside down, where the supposed economic leaders of the world are in hock to the uh, uh, rising powers, where the political balance is completely out of uh, kilter with the economic balance. Uh, we know from history, so it's a, a, you know, doesn't, not a guide to the future, but uh, uh, it does give us a certain uh, grinding. We know from history that that process of realigning politics and economics is never a smooth process. Uh, I'm not going to leave you with the uh, 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 prediction of uh, barbarism, but you know, we have to see that we're much closer to barbarism than we were 10 years ago. You know, we are at a tipping point in that respect. And that is the, the second theoretical question then, as to how the world is going to deal with that uh, transition. Now, in the ideal world, you'd say there's no reason why the whole of the world, West and East, can embrace the opportunities of, uh, of, of the dynamism of the East and being able to restructure itself around that. Um, but uh, we also know that can be seen as a bit of wishful thinking when we see the way that people do try to hang on to what they can no longer justify, namely uh, uh, the history of the 20th century. Uh, we've got that ahead. So the onus on us, I agree entirely to finish my last words, the onus on us is that the, pol the political elites here aren't giving the answers. It's up to you to give some answers to those theoretical questions so we can actually repoliticize economic life in a profound way to actually show that there is something, uh, that, uh, there is something different that we can aspire to and aim for in the future. Okay, Michael, can we have your answers? Uh, well, surprisingly, a lot of them are actually the same answers. Um, I, I agree also with the guy at the back who um, made a question that I think was meant to be a criticism of me, but I, I think we are in a very bad place right now. I think what we have to recognise is that we've avoided something that could have been an awful lot worse by the actions taken, but you know, it is a uh, much more bleak outlook than it has been for a long time. I think a couple of things are important. One of them is historical context. Relative to other periods in history, um, you know, we, we used to see a lot more um, downturns that were a lot sharper and had a much more immediate impact on the real economy. And the kind of practical managerial steps that can be taken will go a long way to mitigate that, which is a, an unmitigated good thing. But that should just be um, put to one side, as Phil rightly says, um, to ask the wider political questions about how we um, you know, restructure or how we structure things um, you know, fundamentally differently. And I think part of that challenge is um, an intellectual one of understanding what's gone on and why, um, you know, understanding how the financial system is operating and how production is operating globally, which is clearly a point of disagreement between uh, me and Phil, but I think you know, a, a constructive and, and productive one to talk through. Um, and then you know, the question of, of what we do should be at the, at the heart of this, and that is, um, you know, as we've said, um, more than a technical question. Okay, if we can thank our panellists.